Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott, and today I'm going to talk about modelling this asset here. I'll be going over how I model something like this and going into lots of detail, and talk about my workflow in terms of painting these objects later and what I'm looking for. So there'll be lots of hints and tricks for low poly hand painted models. So this is where I've got to so far. These models are very straightforward. You can see the log here, for example, is just a cylinder. I chose a six sided cylinder because when that's smooth, if I go into object mode again, set the shading to smooth, you can see that you can't particularly see the edges. Obviously you can around here, but we'll be seeing this from about this distance or somewhere around here perhaps. And it's not too bad. There's a bit of chunkiness, but that's fine. You can paint in quite a lot of that sort of roundness and disguise a bit of these harsh edges. The same goes for these fairly simple. I always like to do a cut in the middle. So if I grab that edge loop by pressing two to go to edge mode, alt left clicking on that edge loop there, I can then grab it to add a bit of distortion to my logs. I can also move to an angle and rotate it slightly. And that just helps to add that bit of curvature and character. And in fact, I prefer that much distortion. So I'll leave it there. Also, you can rotate these. So R and their Z local Z axis, so Z twice, and then you can add a bit of variation there as well. So they stick out and angle in different ways. I'll just quickly do that. So R then double Z, and I can squeeze those closer together. I'm having a little bit of overlap, so the objects overlap slightly. That sort of just keeps their sort of bounding and consistency. When you have too much space between things, they just don't quite sit. It's something you can easily edit later if you find it's just too much. The cauldron is very simple. If we look at that, that's just a cylinder and extruded out and in. And that's quite high poly. Anything that's curved like that is always going to be fairly high poly. So it's quite awkward and hard work to make that low poly. The stone fire down here. Now in the concept art, you can see it's separate stones, but joining them all together like this and making them more blocky stones will give me more polygons. I'll go to the actual polygons themselves and into face mode. I think these two faces could actually do with moving up a bit. Otherwise, there's no point in them. There we go. And they can be stones that are lifted out slightly. And what I usually do is go to one vertex mode and grab a vertex, press O for proportional edit and just sort of move them about a bit and change and vary them. Once you've finished that, though, you must make sure that bottom edge is flat, so scale in the Z zero, without proportional edit on, so I'll turn that off, scale Z zero, and that makes sure that's flat. If I go to side view at the moment, all my objects should be sitting on the X axis, and they're not quite, so I do need to move them up slightly. I want them just below, so they actually insert into the ground. These are just fine, and these are all fine as well. Maybe this needs to insert into the ground very slightly as well, so grab Z and hold down Shift for slight increments in your movement. As I've said before, I'm using a modular approach. So if I select one of these and go into edit mode, you can see that all are selected. And like I showed you earlier, if I move one bit, it moves them all. That's because they're linked duplicates. So I create the other logs down here. So if I press Alt D for link duplicate and move that in the Y axis, and I'll rotate this in the Z axis 180 degrees. So it's pointing the other way. So a bit of variation in the logs, grab another one. Alt D, grab in the Z axis, move it across in the Y. And like I say, a tiny bit of overlap can help them just sit together a bit better. I'll give it a bit of variation as well, rotate it, and I'll rotate it by its local X axis. No, nope, local Z axis, sorry. <laughs> just a bit, so it has a bit of variation again. And just move it across in the X slightly there to keep things interesting. Now in the concept art, there is another log down here. I'll do that later because I'm going to scale that one slightly and I've got to paint it first and then add it in to see whether that's going to work or not. Whenever you scale something that's already been textured, it's going to stretch those textures slightly. So you have to really be careful how you're doing that. And all link duplicates will be sharing the same texture space. Okay, so I'm gonna make the tent now. Let's put my cursor somewhere around here. Shift A to add and a cylinder. Now I've got mine set to six at the moment, and I think this is a bigger object and therefore needs more vertices. So I'm going to put it up to 12 and see what that looks like. Just have a quick scan around and think, will that be okay? 
and I'm thinking we're probably viewing it from about here. It will be bigger, so let's make the radius bigger now. And I'm just going to move the z-axis up a bit. I'm doing it all down here so I don't lose my control. If I start moving this around, I won't be able to edit in here. So is 12 enough? It's always a tough one, this. I'm trying to keep the polygon count down, but I'm also trying to keep that fidelity, so I'm trying to see if that curve still is there and looks nice. There's a sort of ridge there but I think we're going to be okay with that so 12 looks good so that will be fine let's go to the sign view and start scaling it in the Z so it's the right sort of height somewhere around there looking at the cauldron and how it lines up just push that up in the Z axis and probably somewhere around there it's just a bit higher than the cauldron and I think that's about right looking at the concept art so the top of the tent is wider so let's go into edit mode grab that top face and scale it up somewhere around there. And now I'm going to have the top canvas a different object to the bottom canvas. That will make my life easier. And when I come to do the second level or ab adaptation of this house, I can easily copy and paste it. But to make sure I've got the same size, I'm going to duplicate this face. So Shift D to duplicate and just grab it in the Z axis. So it's separated from the model. It's still joined. Now if I press P for separate, and I can just press loose parts and that will separate my object so I can go back into object mode select this one and start moving it about a bit so scale it up just slightly now you see my object origin is still copying the old one so I'm going to right click on it set my origin to geometry and that will set it in the middle let's bring this down slightly and let's go into edit mode and to edge mode select all those edges and extrude downwards somewhere around here and let's go to face mode grab that top face right click and poke faces. I didn't know about that till recently and a YouTuber told me about it. Thank you very much. Let's grab and pull that up in the Z axis. Now that's fine, but it hasn't got much of that shape, that sort of sag that you're going to get in canvas. So we need an inset in there ideally. So what I need to do is go to face mode, C to circle select, grab them all and I to inset. Then I can make my inset like this and scale it in. Oh, I've got the top one selected, so let's go to edge mode, select that edge ring and scale them in. And just try and get that right. It's looking very uniform at the moment, so let's go in and grab some of these edges. In fact, around this point here, we've got that seam, haven't we? That sort of seam in the tent roof. But I don't want to model it at an angle. That's really awkward. It's much better to model it along one of your axes, so you've got some symmetry and things like that if you ever want to turn mirroring on and so forth. So I'm going to have the front of my tent here and that seam will go down there. Now looking at this, can I use the mirror modifier at all? Well, yes, there's a sort of stitch down the side here. So I'll model it as if it's from the Y axis and have that stitch around here. Then I'll mirror it and rotate it. Hopefully that makes sense. That's why when I add a cylinder, I always choose something that's divisible by four. Then you can have your four segments, and if you need to, you could mirror it in the Y and the X axis and just be modeling on one corner. I use the Auto Mirror tool. So in the Edit menu, there's Auto Mirror, and I'm going to mirror across the X axis. Click Auto Mirror, it deletes half your mesh and adds the mirror modifier with clipping enabled. Very handy. I'm going to draw the split and seam in, so I'm not going to model any of that but I am just going to modify a few of these, pulling them around slightly. In fact, let's isolate this with forward slash on my numpad. Had to do that twice for some reason. Three to face mode and let's delete this face. I will need to add a tiny bit of thickness to this, but I'll do that towards the end. Now this is a big area and I'm thinking to myself, can I mirror it when I'm painting on the textures. Well, because it's got that seam down the side, that's going to make it very tough. So I don't think I can do that, so I will eventually have to apply the mirror before I start painting. Let's press O for proportional edit, and G to grab, and start moving some of these around just a touch, adding a tiny bit of variation. Now that's fine, I'm going to apply the mirror now, and add even more variation. So in this case, there wasn't a lot of point using the auto mirror, but sometimes it can speed things up. Out of isolation mode now, and let's think about the base. Now for now, I'm going to move it back just a touch, 
and I'm going to model the tent opening just at the front here. I'm going to keep it on the y-axis so that I can use the mirror because I think I will use it a bit more this time. So let's click on this, auto mirror in the x-axis and it's enabled that for me. Into edit mode and let's start thinking about how I want the tent. I'm going to go into isolation mode and I can delete that top face and bottom face. So three and delete those faces, that one and that one. And I'm going to turn clipping off for a moment so that I can pull this outwards. I've still got proportional edit on, so I'll turn that off. Let's grab this outwards so it looks like a tent. And I'm going to make two cuts, K with the knife tool like this, along there, clipping back on and bring that back together. But also another one around here. So the tent sort of comes outwards like this, although I need to keep that flat and that coming outwards like that. When we go to smooth shading, it will look more like a tent. We need some solidity to this though. So I'll use the solidify modifier up here into solidify just to see what it will look like and to vary the thickness for a bit. So with a bit of thickness, that's looking okay, but it's not wide enough. So rather than joining these two, I might pull them apart to create a bit more variation. Back up to clipping, into edit mode, grab that. It's looking a little better. This obviously is hidden underneath the top. So let's go back out of isolation mode and see what that's going to look like. And let's start adapting our shape. Looking at the concept art all the time, making sure I'm following along with that. I'm going to do another cut in here. And I've just got to think about my triangulation. Is it working with my tent? I might just try a few things like a loop cut around here and a cut in here. And I'm going to scale these without this one. Just scale that in and grab that in. Now that does look nicer, I think. It's got a bit of a shape there, which looks a bit more like a tent. The front isn't quite working for me though. So let's grab those into wireframe mode just to see where they are. And I'm going to move those back just a touch. So I just keep varying, trying to get that sort of general shape. Remember, it's just an outline. A lot of the texture will be painting in, but you'd still want to try and get as close as you can. Just going to scale these in the Z, make sure they're flat. It's not looking too bad at the moment. Now what I might do is do the solidify myself because we're going to have a lot of extra faces in here that we don't need. And I'm going to sort of bring this back so it comes in here and then I'll just paint in black as if we can't see the inside of the tent. I'll show you what I mean by that. Let's go up to here, cancel our solidify modifier and select these edges along here. Extrude those backwards. Have I still got clipping turned on? Let's turn that back on. Grab those and see how that's looking. So something along those lines at the moment. Looks a little strange, but I can paint a sharp edge on here. I probably need this to be open a bit more, so I'm going to use my knife tool and cut a bit in here as well. Right up to the end there. Now these faces will be hard to paint, but they'll just be black, so it's not going to be too difficult. And I may not need this face in here. I'll figure that out in a second. Let's just move these backwards. G, the not Z, the Y. <laughs> there we go. And yes, I don't think I need these, so GG. To edge slide that back there, and then we just got one face in there. That should be okay. And now, can we make that a triangle? I think we possibly can. So I'm going to go into isolation mode to make this a bit easier. Clipping back on. Make sure these two are joined. And this one here, GG slide it down, and then we just got a triangle in there. Because when I convert this all to triangles, it'll be one less face. So I think I've got the rough idea of this tent. It seems very sharp here though, doesn't it? I may have to just add a few more polys in this area because it just looks so sharp and a bit too jarring really. So with the knife tool, I think actually I'm going to go up from here all the way into there. 
I can always reduce these later. So knife again from there into here. Now these ones I want a bit more curvature. And actually I want to grab Shift Z so I don't move them on the Z axis. And this one grab Shift Z. I'll just bring the endpoint in. G Shift Z. And I'm going to triangulate that so I know exactly what it's going to look like. So grab those two and press J to join. Grab and Shift Z. Still looks sharp though, doesn't it? And I'm very reluctant to, but it looks like I'm going to have to do a cut down here as well to give it some solidity. I can probably get away with going up to there this time so it doesn't look so sharp. Grab Shift Z and give it some solidity. Okay, so I think we're there. I'm not so sure about this bit just yet. I might have to do a bit more testing when I come to the textures to make sure that I can paint on this all right. Back out of isolation mode with the forward slash on my numpad and see how we're looking. Now this is another case where do I want to mirror that texture? And again, it's a really big space. So it will take up a lot of space on my texture map, which is very small. So do I want to keep the mirror on this? Therefore, when I'm painting one side, it will paint the other. There's a lovely highlight where it's got a big piece of patchwork on, and that will be obviously copied across the other side and it'll look very symmetrical. I think if the top isn't mirrored, and this is, I'll probably get away with that. I'm also looking across at my concept art and thinking, well, what else is going to take up huge spaces on my texture map? And am I going to need lots of space or can I spend a bit of texturing real estate on this piece? I think I want to turn the mirror off. So I'm actually going to apply it. I can always reapply it later if I find that I haven't got enough texture space and when I first start drawing, everything's a bit too pixelated, then I'll have to just go back in and mirror this. But for now, I think this could do with a bit of variation. So let's grab this with Shift Z and move it out just a slight bit. Grab this one down. And just that bit of variation, I think, makes it look a lot better. Certainly when it's painted, we'll see the benefits of that. A couple more bits to do. There's an ax and some rope supports. The rope supports I'll start with. Let's shift, right click, shift A, and I'll add a cube. Obviously most people think rope and therefore cylinder, but actually we don't need to go above four sides for our cylinder, hence a cube. Hopefully that made sense. So I'll scale this in the Z and just move it into position. Scale shift Z and just get the right length for now. Let's go to one and make sure it's sitting on the ground. Oh, I just noticed my tent needs a bit of adjustment as well. Select all those bottom edges, scale Z zero. And just make sure that I haven't killed or destroyed the shape. That looks better. Now back to this one. Now it's a good idea, I think, to set your pivot point to the bottom of long things like this. Actually, in this case, it's going to be better at the top. I'll explain why in a second. So I'll move my cursor to there, right click, set origin to 3D cursor. Now when I rotate this, it's rotating from the top, which needs to stay still, and I can rotate it out as I see fit. Now I need to adjust my tent top slightly. So I'm going to go in there, grab this bottom edge and scale it out a bit. There we go, that's better. And in fact, it does help if you don't have sharp edges, if you make sure that you curve them really slightly, it helps for painting and it just helps for the look and feel. So that looks good. Back to my support rope. Probably a good idea to follow the edges and angles here. And what I do just have to bear in mind is, is it hitting the floor? So I can scale in the local Z and because my pivot points at the end, I can sort the length out so it intersects the ground. I can also, just to fully optimize, into edit mode, three to select faces, grab the bottom, into isolation mode and the top and press delete those faces. While I'm here, I'm going to mark the back seam there. So control E, mark seam, just so I don't have to keep coming back into this. Out of isolation mode. So let's go to top view. Let's set our cursor to the center here. Use our pivot point as the 3D cursor 
and alt D. Remember this is going to be a linked duplicate, so alt D and move it, rotate it, sorry, round with R. And that should be nicely in position. I'll have to adapt these, of course. And how many do I want? Probably three each side. That's what the artwork suggests. So I think I'll get away with that. Alt D and rotate. I'll just fiddle with those slightly until they're in position. OK, let's go to top view again, back to our 3D cursor and Alt D to rotate these around that point. Some around there, going to adapt these very slightly. Just so there's a nice bit of variation. So let's see what it all looks like when I move it and rotate it around to the side. So top view. Rotate it round. So this is supposed to have a seam down here. Let's just quickly check the shape and see if it needs any adjusting. So I make some minor adjustments here, nothing major, but I thought I'd time lapse it to hurry things up a bit. I change the size slightly just to fit in with the artwork a bit better. And I change some of the cuts, so I go around deleting some that I don't need. And adding some in that I think need a bit of shape adding to it. So nothing new really. And that's good. Last thing we need to make then is the axe. So Shift A. And again, this has to be very low poly. So I'll start with a cube, scale it right down, grab in the Z axis, scale it down a bit further. I'm going to do the handle first. Let's zoom in with full stop or period key on the numpad into edit mode. And let's start moving things around. Okay, so I'll grab this in the X axis. That's my handle. I'll grab this face and scale it down slightly. I'll extrude out from here. And I'll just go into object mode and move that back a little bit, about there. So let's select these faces. E to extrude, right click, and then scale but not in the x-axis. So I'll scale those out. Select this face. E to extrude. And scale that inwards. E to extrude, somewhere around there. Just quickly go into isolation mode and shape this X. Scale in the Y, E to extrude, scale in the Y, scale in the X, and move this back in the X, somewhere around there. And then E to extrude, and scale that down. Okay, we're sort of getting there. Now we want some sharpness here, so we're going to have to join these together. But we still want a bit of thickness here, so I'm probably going to have to do a cut here. So probably somewhere around here, and going down the middle to there. Same with the other side. Now into vertex mode, GG to grab. GG, GG. GG. Okay, so we've got a sharp axe, and let's just modify our shape very slightly. We can draw on some curvature there, but it's going to be tough around here. So do I need another cut? <laughs> These are the problems of the game's asset designer. Might be going a bit too far here for a simple X. So I'm just editing the shape slightly. And let's put smooth shading on. Sort of get a rough idea of how that's going to look and be to model. Do I need this end here? Probably not, no. So let's get rid of that. Into edge mode and dissolve edges. It can be slightly helpful to grab edge loops and move those along slightly, just so you've got a bit to play with with the textures. And I do feel, although it adds polys, it will make more sense if I give this some curvature. 
this at the end here, I want to scale it up in the Z a bit more and rotate it this way slightly. Okay, so a low poly axe from a distance, that looks fine. Let's just check if I can reduce any polys anywhere. I possibly can in here. Let's just make sure that doesn't kill it. And that seems fine. So back out of isolation mode and let's have a look. Let's move this into position, into object mode, and rotate this around. A bit more of an angle. I'm going to turn on by cursor. Now the axe head on the concept art is much bigger, so I'll change that quickly. Into wireframe mode, select those, and just scale them up quite simply. I'm still my 3D cursor. Okay, back into solid mode. See how that's looking. And just adjust these things slightly. So let's just take a quick look around and make sure I'm happy. So there we have it, the low poly modeling in detail. Hopefully you're finding this useful. In the next episode, I'll show you how I painted it. So thanks for watching and I hope this helps.